On April 3, 2021, India wakes up to a dreaded news. Naxalites attack and kill 22 CRPF security personnel in a deserted village of Sukma in Chhattisgarh. This is not the first time the Naxals have killed so many soldiers. But who are the Naxals and how are they able to launch such deadly attacks on India's security personnel? A Naxal or Naxalite is a member of a militant political organization that claims legacy to the Communist Party of India founded in Calcutta in 1969. One day in the month of May in 1967, in a village called Naxalbari in West Bengal, a landlord sent some goons to assault a tribal peasant farmer over a land dispute. Suddenly all the tribals in the area grouped together and beat back the goons. Later on 24th May 1967, when a police team arrived to arrest the peasants, it was fatally ambushed by a group of tribals. A police officer was killed in a hail of arrows. This incident then snowballed into a Naxal movement and the people who joined this movement were called Naxalites after their village Naxalbari. The early 1970s saw the spread of Naxalism to almost every state in India, barring Western India. The areas of concentration of the Naxalite movement is called the Red Corridor. Mao Zedong, the Chinese political leader, provided ideological inspiration for this Naxalbari movement, advocating that Indian peasants and lower class tribals overthrow the government of the upper class by force. By 1980, it was estimated that around 30 Naxalite groups were active, with a combined membership of 30,000. In 1971, Indira Gandhi took advantage of President's rule to mobilize the Indian Army against the Naxalites. She launched Operation Steeple Chase, killing hundreds of Naxalites and imprisoning more than 20,000 suspects and cadres, including the senior leaders. But Naxalism did not end. It survived and was spreading again. In November 2009, the Indian government launched a massive operation dubbed by the media as Operation Green Hunt. This operation was aimed at the five states in the Red Corridor. For this operation, 80,000 central paramilitary personnel, along with a fleet of 10 MI armed helicopters from the Indian Air Force, was deployed. This looked like a final solution for the natural problems in India. But it was far from over. Instead of gaining ground, the security agencies started taking higher casualties. On 15 February 2010, at least 24 policemen died after Naxals overran a security camp in Shilda, West Bengal. On 6 April 2010, the Naxalites created history. They killed 75 CRPF men in a jungle ambush in a place called Dantiwada, Chhattisgarh. This was the biggest casualty the Naxals have inflicted on the Indian paramilitary forces. In the same year and same place, on 17th May, the Naxalites killed 44 CRPF soldiers in IED bus bombing. This cycle of bombing and killing has never ended. From 2010 till 2021, the Naxals have killed more than 200 security personnel. But why has India not been able to suppress the Naxals even after 53 years? This requires a detailed analysis. A host of factors constitute the strength of the Naxals. Remoteness, jungle terrain, absence of administration, and most importantly, the lack of political will has been blamed for the slow progress. Over the years, the Naxals have managed to entrench themselves in remote and inaccessible tribal sockets in few states. Due to this remoteness, the Naxals have set up a parallel system of administration. They have violently opposed any development, especially the construction of roads in these areas. The Naxals raise funds through various methods. The Chief Minister of Chhattisgarh, Mr. Raman Singh, has agreed a year ago that the funding for the Naxals from Chhattisgarh alone would touch a minimum of rupees 150 crores. Extortion is the main source of funding for the Naxals. Big corporations doing business in Naxal areas are the most important source of funds for the Naxals. These industries, which are mainly into mining, manufacturing, metals, etc., have the only option of either paying what the Naxals demand or closing their business in those areas. The Naxals started with bows and arrows. Later, they would loot weapons from police stations. The first time they decided to procure sophisticated weapons from abroad was through the LTT 
which is based in Sri Lanka. The LTT not only provided them arms but also imparted training. After the fall of the LTT, the NSCN, a Nagaland based outfit, helped the Nax Light procure arms and also imparted training. They had created routes through the porous Bangladesh Myanmar border to procure arms. The Nepal Maoists have also supplied arms and have imparted training. With regard to explosives, the Naxals have plenty of it. They have obtained it from mining and fertilizer companies operating in their area. So to sum it all up, the Naxal problem doesn't seem to have an end. However, there's hope. The effect of Naxal influence in the Red Corridor is fading. It's now intensive only in the region of Vastar and Narayanpur in Chhattisgarh. In Andhra and Telangana, at the peak of the problem, the government had created a remote and interior area development authority. In West Bengal, hospitals and bridges were built in Maoist areas. Local people were given jobs. If roads, schools, hospitals and infrastructure for marketing of forest produce comes up in Chhattisgarh Naxal areas, this separatist problem will be finished in a couple of years.